Shalom, Boker Tov, good morning from Jerusalem, Israel. This is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited, established in 1981, and now celebrating our 40th anniversary. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide to this morning's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series, broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel, and now celebrating our second quarter century, having completed the first quarter century of our lecture series from January 1995 until December 2020. And we always remember and will thank the OU Israel Center and its educational director emeritus, uh, Mr. Phil Chernofsky, for making us welcome there for so long. We moved to Zoom when everything got shut down a year ago and we're staying here. Today is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 in the Gregorian calendar. And let me check, it is the 22nd day of ER 5781 in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. We are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, Hill of the Priests, Givat Hanani Abu Tor, overlooking Mount Moriah, where we believe that the third and final Israelite temple of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever. As per the prophet Ezekiel's vision, Seize, please see the biblical book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Our speaker for today, which is why I'm doing this in the morning rather than our usual evening show, is down under in Australia, where Crocodile Dundee walks down the street even in New York, saying to every single person, good eye, good eye, good eye, good eye, good eye. Forgive my pronunciation, it's New York. I'm sorry about that. And our speaker is Professor Gilad Zuckerman, who is chairman of his department at the University of Adelaide. And he is going to be speaking about revivalistics from the genesis of Israeli, Israeli in quotation marks, to language reclamation in Australia and beyond. So now, Gilad, I see what you want to show, but I don't see you. So let's see how we get you back. Uh, now you're back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm handing over the floor to our guest. It's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Lowell. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the uh, Root and Branch Association, R&B. Uh, from Adloyada, Adlayada or Adloyada is my intellectualization for my existence in Adelaide. Adelaide is well known for its wineries and therefore Adloyada is a beautiful phono-semantic matching of the city name of the toponym Adelaide into the Israeli language. Now, I say Israeli language because in uh, 2008, I published a book called Israelit Safayafa, Israeli, a beautiful language. And uh, this book uh, multiplied the number of my admirers slash enemies by a very uh, large number. And um, I continued to uh, look at language revival and uh, what I do these days is reclaiming sleeping beauties or dreaming beauties if I take Jukurpa, which is dream time or dreaming in Aboriginal culture, um, into consideration in Australia and beyond. And recently I published uh, this book by Oxford University Press, uh, which is entitled Revivalistics from the Genesis of Israeli to Language Reclamation in Australia and Beyond. And this is the book that I'm showing you just now. And today I would like to ask several questions, but the main question, and I'll show you some uh, photos on the way, um, is why on earth 
should we invest time and money in reviving dead languages? And this is the focus of the second part of my book. The first focus is on the Israeli language and how the Israeli language came to be. I would like to give you today, in this um, brief lecture, three answers for why on earth should we invest time and money in reviving dead languages or sleeping beauties or uh, walking dead languages or dreaming beauties. The first answer is ethical. This is the right thing to do. The second answer is aesthetic. That is the beautiful thing to do. This is something that makes a world more beautiful. And the third answer is utilitarian. This is the useful thing to do. So the third one is an answer that I will use when talking to uh, public servants, civil servants. They always ask, what's the bottom line? We give you $1 million, how many millions of dollars are you going to save for us? The first answer is what people like me, uh, culturally Jewish, who believe in Menschlichkeit, ask, and this is the right thing to do. So I do what I do, which is reclaiming Aboriginal languages in Australia for a totally ethical, moral reason. These languages were subject to linguicide. But when I talk to the government of Australia, or when I talk to the government of Brazil, or when I talk to UNESCO, or when I talk to any other uh, civil uh, sovereignty, I use the utilitarian benefits. So let me just say before I answer this big question, that there are many related questions that if we had time, we could have discussed. For example, is there a link between language and mental health? The answer is, of course. Should we financially compensate indigenous people for the loss of their native tongues? The answer is, of course. Should indigenous languages be defined as official languages, for example, in Australia? Absolutely. Should we erect bilingual signs? Yes. Does language dictate the way we think? Well, it doesn't dictate, but it influences the way we think. For example, if your language has gender, as in grammatical gender, just like in Israeli, gesher, bridge, is masculine. Uh, ponte in Italian is masculine. In German, the word for bridge, brücke, is feminine. We know from research that when your grammatical gender of bridge is masculine and you're asked to describe a bridge, you're more likely to describe it as sturdy, as large, as powerful. Whereas if the grammatical gender of the word bridge, as in German, is feminine, you're more likely to describe a bridge generically as beautiful and elegant. This is subconscious. So language influences the way you think, but I do not think that it dictates the way you think. I'll give you an example. If you have a language with no word for passion, it doesn't mean that you cannot feel passionate you might find it hard to talk about your passion, but of course you will feel passionate. So it does not dictate. Is it possible at all to reclaim a sleeping, dreaming beauty or a dead language? The answer is yes, but there is a condition, cross-fertilization with the revivalists' mother tongues. It is impossible to reclaim a language as it used to be. And this is why the first part of this book talks about the Israeli language, which is a hybrid of Hebrew on the one hand, which is the phoenix rising from the ashes, Yiddish on the other hand, which is the revivalist's mother tongues, tongue, it's the cuckoo laying its eggs in the nest of another bird, tricking it to believe that it is its own uh, offspring. And of course, Israeli is also a um, magpie that steals from Arabic, from American, from many other languages. So Israeli is a rara avis, or a rare bird. It 
um, includes elements, components, contributions of many languages. And I would argue that Israeli is not an organic evolution of Hebrew, but rather a hybridic revolution, a hybridic genesis, which happened at the end of the 19th century, uh, at the fin de siècle, 1,750 years after Bar Kokhva was killed in 135 in Beitar, which is not that far from where uh, Lowell Galen is currently uh, located. So let me um, start answering. I'll show you more photos. I wish I had time to talk about these photos. You can see that language revival is all over the world. Uh, I work in Africa, uh, in Asia. Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has said Margaret Mead, the famous American cultural anthropologist. Eliezer Ben Yehuda, you see him on the left, was a crazy, a monomaniac. Um, he saw language as one part of the Trinity. The Trinity was not il padre, il figlio e lo spirito santo, as they say in Italian for the Trinity in Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He understood the Trinity that is required for any modern nation. And the Trinity was uh, lens, so cultural heritage, cultural lens. So it doesn't matter whether my great, 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 great grandfather came from Canaan. In my case, he did because I've done a genetic uh, DNA testing and they found out that I am actually from Kenan and I'm a Kohen. Um, or he was a Khazar who converted to uh, Judaism. It doesn't matter. My great 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 grandfather said, Bashanaha Ba'abi Wushalayim Habnuya, whatever accent he had at the time. Uh, he said that. So he had the Jewish lens. And it doesn't matter what his or her, uh, what the genetics of our ancestors are. Uh, lens is one part of the Trinity. Land is the other part of the Trinity. This is the return to uh, Israel, to Eretz Israel. Um, without land, modern nationhood does not um, function. And the third one, and this is something that Eliezer managed to realize, is lang. So it's lens, land, and lang. Lang is language. Uh, in French, and he understood that without a unifying tongue, we cannot have a modern nation. Eliezer Ben Yehuda was not a linguist, he was a politician, and one needs to remember that. And he was monomaniac because he actually dedicated his life to the revival of the Hebrew language, resulting in what I call Israeli. Although he was totally attacked by the uh, ultra-Orthodox who thought he was desecrating the Russian um, uh, Koidish, the holy tongue, the, the tongue of holiness. Uh, he was jailed by the Turks because of that. People who were not ultra-Orthodox thought he was just wasting his time and he would never be successful. So he was, he needed to be um, a little bit kind of crazy, obsessed with uh, one thing. And I see it in my own activities that in order to reclaim a language properly, you need somebody who is a little bit crazy or a little bit obsessive uh, about it. Otherwise it kind of fades out. Now on the right side, you can see Eliezer Ben Yehuda, the grandson on the right and your humble servant uh, several uh, years ago. And uh, what happened, Kalmit Sapir Weitz from uh, Mariv, she's um, a lovely, uh, journalist, she put us together with the hope that we would quarrel because I say Israeli, he says Hebrew, but at the end we became friends. So this photo reflects what happened in Jerusalem. This photo was taken in Jerusalem uh, in uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda's uh, house um, in, uh, near the German colony. 
Uh, this is uh, Ganu Ganumuna. It's a new word for Bini in Bangala. The Bangala Aboriginal language is a language that I'm reviving for the last uh, 10 years. And of course, there was no word for Bini in 1844, where the dictionary uh, by Klamor Wilhelm Schumann was written. That's a dictionary. I'll give you um, some examples. This is what it looks like sometimes, very hard to understand, but sometimes it looks like that. So it's a little bit better because it's uh, typed. Um, this dictionary was written in 1844 by a German Lutheran missionary who tried to Christianize the heathens, in quotation marks. It is used by me, uh, a Jew from Israel, uh, for non-religious uh, reasons, of course, in order to right the wrong of the past conducted by Anglo-Celtic colonizers um, towards the Aboriginal Australians who had been in Australia for at least 50,000 years, they walked from uh, Africa we are, as you know, we are all from Africa. They worked from Africa more than 50,000 years at the time the water uh, between uh, Australia and Papua New Guinea was uh, shallow, so they could actually walk even without, without much um, kayaking or canoeing. And they arrived here more than 50,000 years. We have evidence for that. And uh, Bangala is spoken in Air Peninsula, which is the place in the southern part of Australia where the Aboriginal people who uh, left the north, say Darwin, and went clockwise, met the other Aboriginal people who went anti-clockwise several thousands of years later. So they met in Bangala land around Port Lincoln, Air Peninsula, South Australia, which is approximately eight hour drive from uh, my home in Adloyada in Adelaide, uh, and I go there on a monthly basis. Sometimes I fly, sometimes I uh, drive, uh, a four-wheel drive, and I uh, do all the workshops. So these are some Bangala people. Um, I must study politics and war, that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy, says John Adams, the second president of the United States of America. My sons ought to study mathematics, philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture again, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. I would add revivalistics, lang heritage languages, uh, mamelotions, uh, etc. So I think that this is a beautiful uh, trio or, or if you want uh, trinity uh, or tripartite stage of evolution that unfortunately a lot of what you see these days in the west is again so you know humanities departments are closing down etc so it's against the um, perspicacious words by john adams these are the basic human needs by yet um Another American, this time a Jewish American, Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow, as you know, in 1943, wrote his seminal article, A Theory of Human Motivation. And of course, he put physiological, he didn't put the battery and Wi-Fi, he did not have it. But physiological is kind of at the uh, lower level, safety, belonging, love. If I ask you, where are we today? Well, today, probably we are not even physiological. If you go to India with COVID and... Uh, but say prior to COVID, prior to Pfizer, prior to Johnson & Johnson, etc. The I'm talking about the vaccine, I'm going to take uh, to get the Pfizer in 10 days, finally, um, here in Australia, it's not Israel, in Israel, everybody was already vaccinated if you wanted. Um, but before the pandemic, we we're probably in belonging love. How many people actually self-actualize? A very, very small minority. How many people um, reach their ikigai? Let me explain what ikigai is. Uh, ikigai, I'm taking it from here. It's a beautiful um, idea coming from Japanese. Ikigai is the uh, interface between what the world needs, what you're good at, what you love, and what you're paid for. How many people 
reach their ikigai. They're exactly in the, in the middle there, ikigai. Very, very few. For example, you have accountants who do what the world needs, unfortunately, what they're good at, what they love, but how many accountants, sorry, what they're paid for, but how many accountants love what they do? I mean, I guess a very small minority. If you take my guitarist friend, he loves it, the world needs music, he's good at it, but is he paid for it? Absolutely not, he's paid almost nothing. So Ikigai is very, very rare. Uh, you don't reach your Ikigai. So coming back to uh, our um, situation here, most people do not reach the self-actualization, neither do they reach self-esteem, achievement, mastery, recognition, respect, unfortunately. I mentioned that because I think that eventually we're, we will go up. We will have more hoi polloi, nomis, masses. I'm not talking about the elite. I'm not talking about the, acad the academic elite or, of course, many um, of them do reach the self-actualization. I'm talking about hoi polloi, the, 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 masses, the masses, the what they call asafsuf, um, in, um, in Hebrew, uh, it, they will, it will go up. And why will it go up? Because of the technological revolution. The Industrial Revolution, 1760, 1840, turned people from seeking food to seeking things. Before 1760, we were all seeking food. 90% of us were farmers. I'm talking about the Western world. Uh, after 1840, uh, only 4%, so like out of the people who are listening to this uh, lecture, only 4% uh, of your parents are farmers. Why? Because of the Industrial Revolution. But I would like to propose today that the technological revolution, which is a revolution that allows me to zombie, meaning to become a zombie by, by zooming uh, from Adloyada to Jerusalem, uh, this is a technological revolution. The fact that you have CNN and you have BBC and the fact that we have Facebook and we have Twitter and whatever, uh, WhatsApp or whatever now they, they have. Um, this is the technological revolution. It will eventually turn people from seeking things to seeking ideas. And I'm talking about hoi polloi. I'm talking about the masses again, the normies. I'm not talking about the elite. The elite always look for ideas. I'm talking about the masses, the billions of people in China, etc. When people seek ideas, this is when language revival will become much more common and this is why the answer to the main question today is important why on earth should we invest time and money in reclaiming dead languages before i answer this let me just say the last thing about linguistic revolutions i've mentioned the technological revolution this is the fourth linguistic revolution the first linguistic revolution was speaking more than seventy thousand years ago and it allowed humans to lie, to lie about things, to um, propagate disinformation or fake news. Because if you think about it, before language, human language, we could not lie. I mean, we could not say that my father built the Empire State Building or my father killed the Dead Sea. We just could talk about the now and the here. The moment we have language as human language, and that's important because human language is different from animals' communication. Animals, as far as we know today, cannot discuss language or they cannot uh, make linguistic jokes or they cannot have paraprostokians. Paraprostokians are sentences like Woody Allen's, you know, when I when I met her, I felt I knew her from previous life. Two weeks later, I understood why I had not called her for 1,750 years. You know, this is Power Prostokian or Groucho Marx. Uh, she got her looks from her father. He's a plastic surgeon. This is impossible uh, when animals talk to each other and they cannot produce new sentences that they, have, they had never produced before. So for example, two cows are talking to each other. One cow sees a new bull joining the herd, and one says, mmm, and the other one says, 
That's exactly what I wanted to tell you. That's impossible because cows cannot talk about language uh, and they cannot have sense of humor, which is linguistic. Speaking emerged uh, because of the human uh, urge to lie. Writing emerged approximately 5,200 years ago because of the human urge to steal. And I will explain what I mean. There were thieves between Iraq and Israel, and they stole half of the wheat that the Iraqi, um, this is 5,200 years ago, the Iraqi agriculturists uh, sent to Israel. And then when the, when the Iraqis received in Mesopotamia, in Mesopotamia whatever was uh, in lieu for that, they saw that it was just half the quantity. So the next time they sent the wheat, they wrote down four units of wheat. That was the beginning of writing. Before that, there was no writing. So writing actually emerged for economic reasons because of some thieves on the way. And after that, the moment you have writing, then you can actually uh, have um, kings telling you how many people they killed or how many women they shagged, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The third revolution is the type printing revolution. Uh, approximately 1450 AD or CE, Johannes Gutenberg develops the first European movable type printing press, enabling mass production of books and see parallel Chinese developments. And what we are talking about now is the technological revolution of the 20th century, the big data revolution. Now I would like to answer our question. Let's begin with the ethical reason for why should we invest time and money in reclaiming, revitalizing, and reinvigorating languages. The ethical reason has to do with historical, humanistic, and social justice. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head, says Nelson Mandela. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And the language you see in the background, of course, is Hebrew, or in this case, Israeli. I personally believe that the loss of language is more severe than the loss of land. Let me give you an example of Anthony Forster. Anthony Forster said in 1843, he was a colonist in Australia, the native would be sooner civilized if their language was extinct. This is an ideology of linguicide. George Gray, who was a South Australian governor. South Australia is the state where I am currently. Adelaide is the capital. Adloyada is the capital of South Australia, just as Sydney is the capital of New South Wales. Canberra is the capital of the entire state of, and the entire country, Australia. And he says in 1841, that's before Anthony Forster, the ruder languages disappear successively and the tongue of England alone is heard around. Why does he regard Aboriginal languages as the ruder languages. That's very weird because these languages are very beautiful. I think Australia ought to learn from New Zealand. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander vernaculars should be defined as official languages of their state, territory, or land. Signs, this is the linguistic landscape or what I call langscape with a G, langscape. Remember lang as in lens, land and lang, signs should be both in English and in the local indigenous language. Give me a second, I'm going to ask somebody to be quiet with the photocopying machine, just a second. Sorry about that. I had here a student who was photocopying and made some horrible noise. Uh, hopefully he will go downstairs. Um, this is the Australian Aboriginal flag designed by Harold Thomas in 1971, 12th of July, when I was one month old 
in Israel, I was, I was in Tel Aviv at the time, it was flown for the first time in Victoria Square, Adelaide, which is one kilometer from my office approximately. And if you look at the black, it's, it represents not the sky, this is Adelaide, it's not uh, London, it's not Melbourne, where the weather is kind of blacky, um, reminding me of Iraq, apropos Iraq. You might ask why. Well, this is a pun that again, animals cannot make. It's partly Sunni, mostly Shiite, and no malice uh, intended. So it's partly Sunni, mostly Shiite. This is Melbourne, London. It, Adelaide is extremely blue, and the black here represents the people, the skin of the Aboriginal people. Uh, the red represents the soil, the land, and the land in, Aborig in uh, Australia is red. It's not brown. I can show you photos. I've recently traveled to Western Australia, to uh, the northern part of Kimberley, where uh, Ravich, Melch Ravich, the father of uh, Joisel Bergner, the painter, wanted to establish a Jewish state in the Kimberleys. And there you can see very obviously that the land is red. And what about the yellow? The yellow is the sun, it's the life. I would like to advocate another flag, and that's my own proposed flag for a language day reflecting, reflecting another trinity of people, land, language. So in Aboriginal spirituality, you have a trinity, again, not il padre, il figlio e lo spirito santo, not lens, land, lang, but rather people, land, and language. So this is my flag for Australia. At this point, uh, I would like to show you a five minute clip that um, will show you my work with Aboriginal Australians. After the clip, we will come back and then I will continue with answering the question, why on earth should we invest time and money in reclaiming dead languages? So I'm going to stop the share here and then to start another share. Share here is here. Exit minimize share screen and this. <laughs> mission in Outback, South Australia. As run down now is the local language once forbidden to be spoken inside. Many nearby Aboriginal children were brought here like bungalow man Harry Dare. I was taken away when I was a kid and I, I knew the language. I was just learning the language. Well, I, you know, and I was taken away when I was three years old. So I have no idea. I was in the boys over 12 years. Uh, myself and my two brothers. Steve Atkinson's mother was brought here too, his only link to the Bandala language. There's no doubt that this place contributed to my mother's, uh, I was a decline of the Bandala language for my mother, but uh, I suppose to put it in perspective, it wasn't the missionaries that done that, it was government policy. Uh, even though my mother came in speaking her language, Bandala language fluently, at eight year old, by the time she was 16, she left and she couldn't put her, her sentence together. But just the importance of that, to be able to have that back, is, it's, it's, oh, I don't even, couldn't even put it in the words. Words that fail him in English, let alone his ancestral past. 
Last century's forced adoption policies saw members of the stolen generation taken to places like this mission on the outskirts of Port Augusta, effectively putting distance between them and their language. But while Bangla fell silent in places like this, over in town, there's a place where those words are coming back to life. Bangla's reclamation is beginning here at the old Port Augusta School of the Air. Gilhard Zuckerman, an Israeli-born linguist, is Professor of Endangered Languages at the University of Adelaide. His bold plan is to revive the language using the memories of the elders and a 170-year-old dictionary made by the first Lutheran missionaries. Out of 250 languages, 93% of languages either fell asleep already, so they're hibernating, dormant like Bangara, or they are about to fall asleep. So they have some, let's say, some elders who speak it, but actually uh, the youngsters do not speak these languages. So this is one of the world's records in linguicide. In other words, Australia probably is the worst place in the world when it comes to language hibernation or linguicide, language killing. The seaside people, the Bangla once had many words for sea life. For example, multiple words for shark. Bindu. Bindu. Let me write. Bindu. The song is Bindu. Here, the workshop participants even try to develop new words in language, like internet or computer. But the Bangla of Port Augusta are now a minority amongst minorities, with other tribes, with other languages coming in from the north and from the east. So it's now more important than ever to grasp that the snippets are still alive and to start piecing them together. Coming back here and learning the language is something that I've always wanted to know my language because I grew up knowing my father's side, which is good with that, but I had no idea what my, 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 my mother's side was. So I sort of you know, just reclaiming our language is going to do wonders for my self-esteem as a Bangla man, you know? The community here hopes they can revive Bangla in everyday situations like street signs, greetings, shopping for dinner, or the names of native animals. When you reclaim a language, we have evidence that it actually empowers people. So it results in a personal empowerment. You know, people without a language uh, often are people who lost their heritage, their intellectual sovereignty, their cultural autonomy. So there is this feeling of well-being which is uh, related to language reclamation. It's a, an overwhelming experience because you know, having my mother lose a language and now they being part of that rebuilding and revival of that language is an emotional thing. So I'm proud to be part of it and hopefully I can be my mother and my ancestors proud. Excellent. That was uh, Stephen Atkinson, uh, a lovely man. And now I'm going to share the other one. And to come here. And now I'm going to talk about aesthetic motivations. I hope that by now you got an idea about the ethical reasons for language revival. And now I would like to move to aesthetic motivations. And at the end, I'll briefly talk about the utilitarian benefits as well. There was a linguist at MIT. He was friends with Noam Chomsky. And he said, when you lose, and his name was Ken Hale. And he said, when you lose a language, you lose a culture, intellectual wealth, a work of art. It's like dropping a bomb on a museum, the Louvre. This has to do with taste. I love cheeses. I believe in cheeses. Uh, if I go to the uh, central uh, market of uh, Adelaide, which is one of the best markets in the world, actually, if they tell me, excuse me, sir, we only serve cheddar cheese, I'll be extremely disappointed because I like my shabishu 
uh, I like my uh, um, Roquefort, you know, we have many cheeses here, but you might be malabsorbent, lactose intolerant, and this is a matter of taste. Look how beautiful Australia used to be, 400 different Aboriginal languages, different Aboriginal sounds, different Aboriginal meanings, different Aboriginal syntaxes, etc. Look how beautiful, look how ugly. Uh, the reason it's ugly from my aesthetic perspective, um, from my own aesthetic perspective, is double. Firstly, it is monochrome, which is not beautiful, uh, as opposed to this one. And secondly, the lines are very straight. And if you look at this line, which is between Western Australia, where I've just been, and South Australia, uh, this is wh where you see the cursor is uh, where Bangala land is. This is Adelaide here. What looks like Italy is York Peninsula. It looks a little bit like, a, like the Italian uh, uh, boot. And um, this line is a continuation of a line that divided South America between Brazil and uh, between the Portuguese and the and the Spanish, so like Brazil and uh, Argentina, which is ironic because there were so many lines that were Aboriginal and they <laughs> preferred a line between Portugal and Spain, which is uh, ridiculous. Um, this is what we do not want. We do not want Homo sapiens sapiens Israelicus vulgaris, you know, the human who knows she knows, to become a barcode. This is what we want. At least this is what. I wish. Here you can see a singer, famous Hong Kong singer, a linguist. Well, she's from Hong Kong. I am from Israel. Rita is from Finland, a scientist. Uh, Antonella is from Italy, a politician. Ling Ling is a businesswoman from Singapore. That's just uh, uh, an example from my own childhood. This is the most complex Chinese character I have ever encountered. And it has, I think, 56 strokes, you know, one character. I mean, if you think about it, A only has one stroke, yeah, like that. But here you have 56 strokes. Um, if you manage to stroke it without getting a stroke, that would be, that would be good. This is in Adelaide. Uh, they managed to put it on one of the restaurants here. Tasty Biang. This is a panda, beautiful, tapir, uh, giraffes. The survival of the Tasmanian devil is important. What about the survival of the Palawa languages of Tasmania? Why is it that so many people care about zoodiversity or biodiversity, but so few people care about linguistic diversity? I think that linguistic diversity is beautiful. I'm not against animals, of course. I. Uh, give uh, I pay my dues to the uh, to the Adelaide Zoo. Uh, I love animals, but I think that it is sad that if you can touch land, you can touch animals, then you automatically care about their diversity. But if you cannot touch their languages are intangible, then hoi polloi often forget about the importance. I believe in aesthetics of language, Mami Shapinata Pai in Yagan, in Tierra del Fuego, in Chile and Argentina is a word that means a look shared by two people, each wish, wishing that the other will offer something that both really want to do, but nobody has had the guts to initiate it so far. Now, I remember having this feeling when I was 15 in Jerusalem, uh, where uh, Lowell is now, uh, but I did not have a word for it. In Yagan, you have a word for it. And as a linguist, I can analyze this word morphologically. Like, Ichlapi is the root, to be at loss at what to do next, etc. Nahur, in uh, ancient Persian, is a camel that will not give milk until her nostrils have been tickled. This one I had never an idea about, and I don't think I could imagine this. After all, human beings have a very limited imagination. It's enough to look at aliens in Hollywood films. They all, or most of them, look like ugly human beings. 
needless to say, no alien would look like an ugly human being. This is ludicrous, and it shows how stupid we are. But now, when we finish the ethical reason, what is right, we finish the aesthetic reason, what is beautiful, I would like to turn finally to the utilitarian reasons, health and well-being. Language revival, as you saw in this small clip that I showed you, can result in personal, mental, spiritual, and physical well-being, a sense of pride and self-esteem. It's the best antidote, in my view, for self-loathing. Why do I say self-loathing? Because colonized people as a generalization, and of course I generalize, after all, I'm a linguist, no linguist, I mean, every linguist must generalize because a language is a generalization. A language is an abstract ensemble of idiolects, sociolects, dialects, and other lects. A language is a collection. It's a collection of lects. No two people speak the same language. So a linguist must generalize, otherwise he or she is not a linguist, he's a spy. So I'm generalizing here too when I say that colonized people in, as a generalization, hate two types of people. Obviously they hate the colonizers. This happens even generations after. And the second thing, which is much more tragic and much more important, they hate themselves. And the reason is that the colonizers told them, you are part of the fauna, you're not part of human beings. The, it's a little bit like Pygmalion effect. Yeah? If you tell a child, you're a genius, you're the most beautiful creature, you're the it is much more likely that the child will be clever than if you tell a child, you're nothing, you're an idiot, you, you're a fuckwit. So you, this is the Pygmalion effect. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important effect in education. But this effect happens also socially, unfortunately. And by reclaiming a language, Minority people, indigenous people, disadvantaged people reconnect with their heritage. And nobody said that their heritage was less good than the Christian heritage or another heritage. I say Christian because these were the missionaries who came. I mean, there were obviously no, no Jewish missionaries. Um, so this is an email from Jenna. She's a Bangala woman. Personally, I found the, the experience of learning a language liberating. Bold letters mine went home feeling very overwhelmed because we were finally going to learn our own language. It gave me a sense of identity. And I think if the whole family learned a language, then we would all feel totally different about ourselves and each other, because it's almost like it gives you a purpose in life. These are Bangla women. Bangla women. Facebook comment from Evelyn. A big thank you on behalf of our family here in Port Lincoln. Our ancestors are happy. This is something that Aboriginal people would say when they are happy. Our ancestors are happy. This is after the uh, first reclamation workshop uh, in Air Peninsula that I conducted. Since then, I've conducted dozens of workshops. Language is power. Let us have ours, says perspicacious Aboriginal politician Aidan Ridgway. Darcy Hallett, Michael Chandler, and Christopher Lalonde in 2007 published an article in Cognitive Development called Aboriginal Language Knowledge and Youth Suicide. What they discovered is a clear correlation between youth suicide and lack of conversational knowledge in the native language. They looked at six different tribes. One tribe did not have the language linguicided, the language was still uh, healthy, no youth suicide. Another tribe, its language was killed, a lot of youth suicide, and the four others were kind of exactly in correlation. What I believe is that just as language killing or language loss results in youth suicide, just like that, language gain or language revival results in the reduction of suicide and the empowerment of mental health and the improvement of well-being. 
So I, with some other uh, collaborators, have um, an NHMRC, it's a National Health and Medical uh, Research Council project that looks at the unmeasurable. And my um, collaborator, Alex Brown, he's an Aboriginal professor, he says, what scientists hold stock in is only what they can measure but you can't measure the mind or spirit. You can't weigh it. You can't deconstruct it. But only if we do, will they see that Aboriginal people are spectators to the death of their culture, their lives, etc. We watch as our culture dies. How are you going to measure that? And what we are trying to do in this um, revolutionary um, project that looks at language reclamation and well-being, whether or not there is a correlation, we are trying to find out whether our hypothesis is correct, improvements in mental health and social and emotional well-being during and following the language reclamation process. So this is exactly what we are currently doing and hopefully we will publish uh, many articles in the future. We've already published two that will show this uh, correlation. There are many other utilitarian benefits. For example, I will just summarize it because I can talk about it for not hours, but days. When you are natively bilingual, you are more clever than yourself as a monolingual. We have plenty of evidence for that. I could cite hundreds of researches for that and you can find it in revitalistics. But there is also a medical advantage. Evidence shows that being natively bilingual slows dementia by approximately four and a half years, improving quality of life for many and reducing money spent on medical care. So if you don't want to get dementia, and if it's unfortunately already written in your genes, ensure that you are native bilingual. And if you want to help your kids, ensure that they are natively bilingual, they will get the dementia 4.5 years later. I would like to conclude by telling you several things. Um, in science, Australian science, Australian science, Lowell mentioned Gudaimai, Gudaimai, or Gudai, but you need to say Gudaimai, Gudaimai. These are Australian science, Australian science. This is an Australian sign or Australian signs from Sydney. You need to tell me whether the ticket I received on the left was justified. Uh, this is how signs for parking in Australia are. This is another Australian sign, don't drive like air. My students from foreign students could not understand it. It's don't drive like a knob, K-N-O-B, knob. Don't drive like a, my Chinese student here asked me whether it's don't drive like a chicken because you kind of run from uh, one lane to another, but actually it's don't drive like a cock. And this is the best one. When I saw it, I made a very dangerous U-turn because I'm a linguist and I'm interested in such uh, rebuses. And when I made this U-turn, one of the other drivers shouted, don't drive like a wanker. So I understood that this is what it meant. W Anka. It's not Visotsky T as you have the Visotsky uh, sign like in Israel. But this is the best sign and this is the sign I would like to end my presentation here um, to the Root and Branch Association with. And this is a sign that I found in Victoria, which whose uh, capital city is Melbourne. Melbourne, very famous city. Some Americans pronounce it Melbourne, but actually it's Melbourne no R pronounced Melbourne. If your language is endangered, do not allow it to fall asleep. If your language falls asleep, stop, revive, survive. Of course, in the case of Victoria, that means stop the car, have some Vysotsky tea, revive yourself, and then you will survive. Otherwise, you'll have an accident. But I am reanalyzing this sign as stop, revive your language, Otherwise, you won't survive. You will survive as assimilated to the mainstream, but you will not survive as a mensch uh, with heritage, with, uh, uh, in our case, uh, as 
Jews is with Menschlichkeit and with a one on the one hand, on the other hand, on the third hand way of thinking. You know that um, uh, Hordel uh, Tevye uh, in Fiddler on the Roof uh, asks his daughter Hordel, why are you seeing this Bolshevik called Perchik? He's a horrible man. He does not believe in God. You know, like Tevye was a religious Jew. And she tells him, because I love him. And uh, this is what he says. And I'll just uh, uh, quote from my memory. Love, it's a new style. On the other hand, our old ways were once new, weren't they? On the other hand, they decided without parents, without a matchmaker. On the other hand, did Adam and Eve have a matchmaker? On the other hand, well, yes, they did. And it seems that these two have the same matchmaker and he looks at the sky, yeah? This for me is the epitome of Jewish thinking, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the third hand, on the fourth hand. And what I'm saying here is that if your language falls asleep, you need to stop, you need to revive and you need to survive. Otherwise you will not survive, you will survive as something else. If you revive a language, embrace the hybridity of the children's emerging tongue because it will never be the same. And I have no problem whatsoever with it. Language revival results in new diversity, in a new diversity. And most importantly, if your language is healthy, say you're American, and obviously the American language is healthy, no, no threat is there for the American language. Um, and, and hopefully it, it will stay like that. If your language is healthy, consider helping others in linguistic need. You have hundreds of tribes, thousands of minority people who need help, who would like you to help, especially if you're a good linguist. They need help if you're a good revivalist. And this is something you can study. And you can study it by watching such clips like the one here by reading uh, books like the one that I showed you uh, today. And that's it. It was wonderful um, talking to you, to your association level. And I am open for questions if you have. Um, otherwise, I will go and pick up my uh, little son from uh, soccer. They call it soccer. Here in England, I called it football, but I guess they follow the American, the American way. First of all, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Okay, because I have both the uh, audio control on the computer and on my new headphones, the audio control, but I can't tell whether I turn yes. it left or right, whether I'm blowing it or raising it. I have so many questions, comments, I don't know where to begin. And I don't want to get your little boy to get mad at daddy and say, why are you late? I'm never talking to you again. And we did begin <laughs> later than we were supposed to because I couldn't get the live feed to YouTube Root and Branch channel to work because the first time in one year, the system from Google said, we don't recognize who you are. We need another level of security. Send a code to my cell phone, which I lost. And I stopped to get a new SIM card for the new cell phone. So we're doing this in record mode and then it will be posted to the YouTube channel. Well, uh, as the Zen masters say, form without content is meaningless and content without form is empty. It would seem self-evident that in terms of content, one can express itself in form, the more languages the better. Just like it would seem so self-explanatory why you want to keep languages alive and revive them, that it doesn't require a commentary. But apparently from what you're saying, it does. So I'd ask your listeners, would you all want like Oliver Twist in, Oliver Twist, uh, what was the name of the book? Oliver Twist, to go, please may I have more, sir. And assuming they said, yes, it was always porridge and let's say porridge every day forever with no salt, butter, milk, or honey, or sugar, I don't think you'd like that at all. It would seem logical to any person 
that you want to have uh, diversity in everything, music, art, language, food, clothes. Otherwise, life is very dull. And as William Blake said, the five senses are the inlet of the soul upon the world. So I don't really see, I don't understand why there would be any argument with this. I can understand why if you have, like in India, 2,000 native languages, fine. In order to talk to each other, you need one general language, or you have Mandarin in China and 20,000 dialects. That, or you need a world language, whether it's Esperanto or English or Zulu, or whatever it's going to be. But why, if you would have one main language for different groups to talk to each other, why wouldn't you want to have your ethnic languages? So my question to you, which you've been dealing with, are colonialism, and if we don't exterminate all the local people afterwards, we need someone to shine our shoes and service at our cricket matches. Why would you, why, why would you get an argument from anybody about keeping languages and cultures alive and or reviving them well, if they're dead. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, the main, uh, well, the main two arguments against revivalistics are as following. Uh, one of the arguments that I hear, both are flawed, but I'll tell you what they are. Uh, one of them is that if we have only one language in the world, there will be no wars. So everybody will understand each other. And uh, these people believe that wars are because we don't understand each other. Of course, what I tell these people, Google Rwanda 1994 and Google Syria 2021. And you will see that the people who uh, kill themselves like animals are people who speak the very same language, the very same dialect. So the Hutus and the Tutsis did not have a different language in Rwanda, etc. In fact, many civil wars, and uh, here historians can um, join my argument, were fought by people who spoke the very same language. So I disagree that if we have one language, all the wars will disappear, and uh, and you know we will have a kind of uh, a John Lennon's um, uh, work. <laughs> this is one thing. Uh, the other thing, people say. Oh, I mean, these kind of primitive Aboriginal people, why should they not just learn English properly and, and become, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Aussies, just like everybody else, assimilate, and uh, we don't want to keep their uh, old ways. So, you know, this is kind of a more of a racist idea that, you know, the English is, the, is a better language. And I mean, and th this one you can actually hear in uh, Anthony Forster, as I said earlier, but you can hear it today as well. Um, there are many bogans in Australia. I don't know if you use this, this term bogan. It, it's like- I don't know. But, uh, bogan, yeah. So bogan is a B-O-G-A-N. I added it to the Oxford English Dictionary several years ago um, because it's a very commonly used word in Australia and also sometimes in New Zealand, but uh, nobody in India, for example, knows Bogan. And how do I know that? <laughs> because uh, I went to an opera here, La Sonnambula, and I, uh, I was introduced to somebody called Peter Hoban. And I told him, oh, Hoban, what a beautiful name, just like Russell Hoban, the famous American children's book uh, writer who uh, said, and then I quoted, language is an archeological vehicle full of the remnants of dead and living pasts, lost and buried civilizations and technologies. The language we speak is a whole palimpsest of human effort and history. To which he replied, oh, that's so beautiful. And you're the first person in Australia who got my name right. Everybody thinks my name is Hogan, just like Paul Hogan that you mentioned. <laughs> and then he told me yesterday, I received an, a, a, um, a, a phone call from Optus. Optus is one of the um, uh, you know, mobile companies. There's Telstra, there's Optus, and uh, like AT&T or whatever. And uh, they said, would you like to upgrade your plan, Mr. Hogan? So I told her, it's not Hogan, it's with a B. So she said, would you like to upgrade your plan, Mr. Bogan? And she thought that with a B was Bogan. And of course she was from India. Had she been from Australia, she would have never thought Bogan because it's impossible that his name would be Bogan. I mean, if, if his name is Bogan, he would probably change it. It's a little bit like if your name is, I don't know, 
uh, mutatis mutandis, if your name is Eichmann or, you know, I mean, you change it, right? I mean, how many Eich Eichmann do you know? Do you know? I mean, except, of course, of course, the, the, the son or the grandson, I mean, I know that he is uh, a wonderful man who actually uh, talk a lot about reconciliation between the Germans and the Israelis, etc. I mean, I think that he, his name might be Eichmann, but otherwise, I mean, how many people do you know whose first name is Adolf? Or, so, uh, yeah, so this is, um, this is why um, I've mentioned uh, Bogan. So coming back to your question, I can tell you that there are hundreds of people I've met who are against language revival. They say, no, just speak English. You know, let's have a world. It's simple. You know, uh, life made simple. Don't forget that most Aussies, just like most Americans, just like most New Zealanders are monolingual. Let's not okay. forget that. Oh, I thought you were going to go on. I, um, you're gonna, you didn't finish that thought. I just said, okay, agreeing with you, but no, you, were, you sorry, weren't finished. Monolingual, monolingual um, it's not only being monolingual, it's much more, it, it's the worst thing is having a monolingual mindset. <laughs> a monolingual mindset is, for example, when somebody say, gives the example of uh, neg, neg in, in Chinese, in uh, the University of Southern California, he's fired from the course because some people say that it, they got uh, um, offended because it reminded it reminded them of the N word in American, but this is a filler in Chinese. Every 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 time I speak Chinese, I, I hear like neg neg. You know, this is like uh, that that that. I told you that that that. You know, it, it, but when you have a monolingual mindset, you're not capable of understanding that this is a different language, and it's okay that there is a homophone there, and the the professor does not need to be fired from the course just because of using that. I mean, it's ridiculous. It just shows shows you. The monolingual mindset is also the reason why you have A-men and A-women, you know, like recently. I mean, mm. uh, in, in, the, in the American, whatever, um, the American, uh, what was it in the parliament or the uh, senate or whatever. So, I mean, monolingual, monolingual mindset is what causes people to be very worried about other languages about, um, you know, languages that are unfathomable if you are an English speaker, etc. So, you know, it's an unfortunate reality, especially for a linguist like me to have such a bogan um, ways of thinking around. Okay, I have <laughs> three questions, comments. One is, uh, one of my favorite actors or well, Dame Edna, Barry Humphreys, is still alive. Is he still performing as Dame Edna? That's, that's the first question. Because, because, well, you're asking because Dame is politically incorrect, is it? No, I think he's fantastic and he's really funny. And uh, I was told by a neighbor that he's not feeling so well these days, someone who knew him from his college days, and that he, he wasn't uh, yes. continuing to be Dame Edna. I thought he was terrific as Dame Edna, and I hope he won't stop. Uh, oh, you know. I see, I see. So, and why, why is John not continuing to, uh, to be Dame Edna? Is it because of... Which Barry Humphreys uh, is his name, the Australian actor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry Humphreys. Yes, uh, I know, I know Barry Humphreys. Yeah. Let's put I that on why. the... So, I mean... Yeah, yes. I'm listening. You don't have to know why. Let's put that on the side of something to look into. I thought he was terrific. And I think that the world would be much poorer in the world of, of comedy and humor if yeah, Dame Edna retired. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but he's very old, right? He's like in his 80s. So I, I better, don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm going to check that. I'm going to look into that because that's what I was told that he was now yes. quite elderly and not in the greatest conditions. I'm, I'm making a note to look into that. Now my other, the, that was just a footnote on the side. Now I get to my two questions, yeah. comments. Number one, yeah. George Orwell <laughs> in 1984, one of the points he seems to be making is that if we want to corrupt people's thinking, corrupt the language. 
because thoughts are dressed in words. So for example, uh, neurotypicals, that's what we would call them, love euphemisms. Uh, we don't say people are hungry, we say they have food insecurity. We don't uh, say um, people are submitted to sex slavery, we say they are subject to human trafficking because in general, what we regard as neurotypicals don't like direct perceptions of reality, especially if they look and smell bad. So they like to fog out. We wanna kill someone in Vietnam, they're terminated with extreme prejudice. Okay, uh, yeah. I would agree with George Orwell completely. Is now, hmm? yes. I mean, look, um, language has been manipulated and uh, used for political, religious, um, economic uh, benefits for ages. I mean, uh, if you listen to the way that rabbis, priests, uh, imams, politicians, uh, Philip Morris cigarette company, if you listen to, to how they use language, it's all manipulation. I mean, Philip Morris right. uh, would tell you, you do not smoke, you unsmoke. It's not a cigarette, <laughs> it's a vapor. I mean, it's all linguistic. Man. Of course, it, it's not carcinogenous. It's just like, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's just a, a linguistic, um, it's, it's uh, what we call la puissance du verbe, the, the power of the word, the power of the word to change the way that you think about the referent that the word stands for. And this is, by the way, sometimes used by national movements, etc. I mean, you look at Mishkan. Mishkan, for me, is the building of the Knesset in Israel. You know, the, this is Mishkan a Knesset. But Mishkan, of course, echoes sanctity and it echoes a holiness because Mishkan in the Bible is where you put the Ohel Moed, you know, the where you put the the Ten Commandments, it's, it's Ohel Moed, it's, it's, a temp, it's the most important, the holiest part of the temple. And uh, Mishkan, when you enter the Mishkan, you think of angels and seraphs and cherubs uh, rather than of, you know, like um, thieves. So, I mean, this is all a, a very clever uh, ideological secularization. I mean, when right. you think of Miluim, uh, Miluim in the Bible is a period that has to do with the ordination of the priests. But Miluim, when I when I do Miluim, it's I don't work God; I work the state of Israel. So this kind of deification, if you want, if if I'm deification, is something that happens in Israel, and this is the use of language for a different goal. So I mean, it's not for God; it's for the state. So you know, kind of. Uh, the new God is the, is the state, etc. I mean, so right. this is done by, by everybody. I mean, every, everybody in power, right. or most people in power, use, use language. Right. A good example of that here is when a murderer, euphemistically known as a terrorist, is killed. He is not killed. He is neutralized. I have a problem yes. with that. Whoever, I have a pro whoever, whatever the background of the murderer is, uh, he, is, he, she, or it is not neutralized. They are dead. Now, in the prophet Safani, it says in chapter 3, verse 9, for then I, God, will turn to the peoples a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Uh, yes. That does not mean that everybody will speak this uh, Latin or Hebrew or Greek. It means we'll be able to understand each other, maybe through activation of higher telepathic paranormal centers of consciousness. Regarding multiculturalism, what I learned from one rabbi I thought made sense was what's good multiculturalism and what's bad my multiculturalism? Was it good that at the Tower of Babel, God scattered the peoples who were of one language and one purpose around the world or was it not good? If you look at the Book of Kings, the Assyrian kings who take the northern tribes in three expulsions, depop, deportations, they put them in different parts of the empire. They mix them up. 
and then they bring other people into Samaria who become known as the Samaritans. And when Rab Shaka, the court Jew of his time of San Chariv, comes and speaks to the Jews in Jerusalem, he says, listen, don't fight. You, first of all, you can't beat my king. No one else has, no one else's gods have saved them. He will take you to different land. Bad multiculturalism is when an emperor or a king or a ruling power takes subject peoples, and I want to strip you of your identity, so I'll remove you from your land because our identity is very connected to our land. I'll put you somewhere else, maybe give you a new language, new religion, new this, new that. Maybe I won't even give you names. I'll give you, uh, I'll brand you as a slave. Uh, with a branding iron, maybe I'll put a uh, uh, tattoo in you in, in very soon. I'll, I'll give you a chip and you will owe nothing. You'll be happy because you don't even exist. You're human capital with the emphasis on capital, human just thrown in because that sounds nice. So good multiculturalism that the rabbi said was why before everybody comes back together to believe in one God and one moral law, however, what I'll get to that in a minute is one comes back from 6,000 years of dispersion. How many years was it? the Tower of Babel? Everybody has different food, different music, different clothes in a good sense. That's good multiculturalism. Bad multiculturalism is, you know, different strokes for different folks. You engage in child sacrifice, human sacrifice. I don't. What? You're racist, sexist, and you don't respect my culture? The answer is, when it comes to violating universal moral laws like theft, murder, and rape, the answer is no. That multi, like Tevya says, you mentioned Tevya, where he gets to the child that wants to marry the, the very handsome young U Ukrainian, because I think uh, Anna Tevka's in Ukraine, and he says, I bend, it's a new world, but if I bend that much, I'll break. That it is, there are certain points where, no, we, no, we do not agree to general, genital mutilation of ladies in Africa in the Muslim world. Uh, no, you can't do that. Why not? You think your culture is better than mine or burning a wife on her husband's funeral pyre as in Suti? What? You think you're better than us? In that case, then from a very traditional Jewish perspective with the Noahide covenant laws, the answer is yes. Different concepts, okay. But no, you may not engage in theft, murder, uh, rape, and child human sacrifice. And no, the uh, Hutus may not murder 900,000 Tutsis, and no, you may not murder 3 million people in Cambodia, whatever good reasons you may use to justify that. So that would be good multiculturalism instead of bad multiculturalism, and within that, just as we don't want to mix up our slave populations, and you wear pajamas if you wear anything at all, and what in Dr. Zhivago in the beginning, the Dr. Zhivago's child is being interviewed by the officer who said, wondering if that's Dr. Zhivago's child, and then says she was uh, uh, a nameless number on a piece of paper that was lost. That is not good multiculturalism from a very deep Torah perspective. So uh, again, we come back to languages. The only reason I can think of why people would oppose preserving native languages and cultures as a, or reviving dead ones is, if I'm the 1% or ruling class, I'm a Gnostic. I'm one of, I believe in Plato's The Republic. You'll have the king, the aristocrats, the muscle, the army, and everyone else is slave. We have too many of you, we'll kill you off, starve you or we'll engage in eugenics, we don't need you, you don't exist anyway, you're not people, uh, then you really don't need anything. You may not even need to learn how to read and write. So if one has that perspective, uh, you don't really need, we need, uh, well, we need a common core where you can barely learn to say two and two is four because you're not meant to be used for anything more than that. So uh, again, I get, not, anytime I see that someone would be opposed to what you're saying, my radar goes on. Yes, Herbert Becca of the SS and Hunger Plan asked, we will exterminate all the Jews in the final solution, 80% of the Slavs, because you're only needed as a slave population, so we need 20% of you. And no, you don't need your names, your music, your art, your culture. You don't need anything at all. You're untermensch. And by the way, one other point. Many people, and I know you told me a little bit about your background, many people think the Germans and Nazis regarded Jews as untermensch. That's not true. 
The Germans had a, Nazis had a special name for Jews, the Gegenrasse, the anti-race, the only race of equal psychic, physical power of them, like the Jedi and the Sith. And it's, this is not understood by Jews in general and Israelis because it gets into weird areas of occult religion, which is scary to Jews and Israelis because they can't imagine people would think and make, take actions based on those beliefs. The Nazis believed we, you and me, Jews, are a Gegenrasse that has to be exterminated and you need a museum in Prague, but exterminated as in no one left. Untermentioned, that's, you know, dumb Poles, dumb Slavs, dumb, dumb Russians. We'll kill off most of them, but we still need a few as slaves. So getting back to what you said, when anyone says, uh, why not preserve a small language or revive a dead one? My radar goes on because I start smelling gas chambers. Well, they don't have any smell. Uh, ovens and uh, my radar goes on for trouble. So I know your son is waiting for you at the soccer game, and I don't want him to be mad at you, so we'll never have another program together. I'll, I'll just, but I'll I have just, to give the I'll concluding just, comment to say, you. You have to make the concluding I'll comment. You're say, the speaker. No worries. So uh, look, uh, it was a pleasure. I'm sorry that I have to, uh, to go, really. Uh, I'll just say you've mentioned the Tower of Babel, and, uh, and you've mentioned um, the Bible, and it... Probably it's very interesting that, as I see it, God created the linguist. The linguist killed God, and I will explain. And it kind of uh, is related to many things that you said, uh, for example, echoing Friedrich Nietzsche. God created the linguist in the form of what he or she or whatever did in the Tower of Babel. So you had one language, you went kind of up and up and up and God said, oh shit, are they going to do what's happening here? No, I'm going to uh, confuse their language. Uh, and this is Babel. Uh, and, uh, and this is the beginning of linguistics because of course, if we only had one language and linguistics would have been a very limited science. You know, now when you have many languages, it's beautiful for linguistics. <laughs> But then why did ling a linguist kill God? Because the moment you looked at, at the book, yeah, I mean, uh, what, <laughs> the book of Genesis, not, uh, not, not this book uh, from the Genesis, but, but the book of Genesis, the, the real Genesis, and you, um, you kind of said, hey, this is written in a different dialect. Oh, this is written, this is a mistake. This is an error. This is a transcript, an editorial mistake. This, the moment you look, you looked at the Bible, at the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and you analyzed it from a philological perspective, I would like to propose that that was the beginning of atheism. So God created the linguist, the linguist killed God. And with this uh, kind of sentence, probably I should say goodbye, but I should say goodbye with uh, my Kohen uh, heritage, uh, which is now employed by Leonard Nimoy, because of course he's a Kohen too, and he brought it to uh, Klingon or Klingon or to Star Trek. It was a pleasure to uh, to meet you, and uh, keep me posted about everything. Okay, Gilad. Uh, the way we usually conclude our programs is thank the speaker, thank the audience, uh, thank your son for being so patient. It's my fault we started. Don't don't be sorry that you can't spend more time. We started 50 minutes late because I couldn't get past the security to go live on Facebook. So we want to thank all our viewers and listeners uh, when this will be posted to YouTube. Uh, we want to thank Professor Zuckerman for taking this time to talk to us about revivalistics from the genesis of Israeli to language reclamation in Australia and beyond. Uh, again, today is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 in the Gregorian calendar. It is the 22nd day of ER 5781 in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. And we ish, wish you all a shalom from Adelaide, Australia. Did I get it right? Adelaide. And from Jerusalem, Israel. Thank you and uh, goodbye to everybody for now.